It's great to see you all this morning. Can we just say one more time how much we appreciate the decision made by those stepping into baptism today? And while you were applauding, how many appreciated the job that Jonathan, Pastor Jonathan did last Sunday uh, talking about the first part of Galatians chapter 2? I'm going to try to finish that chapter this morning. And so we're beginning in uh, verse 11. It said, when Cephas, and that's uh, also a name for Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned for before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, you are a Jew and yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles, and, and what is, uh, that's kind of an air quotes thing, not sinful Gentiles, because that's how Peter saw them right then. Know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Uh, chapter 2 in Galatians is actually a story of two journeys. And last week, Jonathan talked about the journey that Paul took to Jerusalem. But this, this uh, part of the chapter talks about uh, Peter's journey to Antioch. And while last journey went really well, this one doesn't go well at all. There were people in the, in the faith in Jerusalem who... They tried to marry the idea of their Judaism and Christianity, and, and Judaism had a lot of laws. In fact, they, they were brilliant in their capacity to create guidelines and guardrails by which they could live. And some of those included things like dietary restrictions. Anybody here in the house uh, have dietary restrictions? Yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> that makes you a Gentile. <laughs> the Jews had many. And foods, as well as actions, could be categorized into two areas. One was what was clean, and the other was what was unclean. And these weren't part of the Ten Commandments. They were part of something called the ceremonial law. The ceremonial law. So Paul challenges Peter for being a hypocrite, and the answer is why. Well, we know a hypocrite is someone who pretends to believe something, but actually acts differently. They, they could even criticize others for doing the very same things that they do. And he challenges Peter for being a hypocrite because he knows something about Peter. He knows that in Mark chapter 7, Peter was present when he heard Jesus say these words. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, the disciples asked him about this parable. 
Are you so dull, he asked? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. Peter was there for that conversation. And now, and, and he'd been sitting at the tables, eating everything with the Gentiles. But now that some of the people from Jerusalem came to visit, he starts backing off. Also, there was something else that happened to Peter. It's in Acts chapter 11. This is what Peter says. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, birds, and then I heard a voice telling me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And I replied, surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. And the voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Right after that experience, Peter's invited to a Gentile's house where he goes and preaches the gospel. And they not only respond to the gospel, they actually receive the Holy Spirit as well. And they wanted to be baptized in water, just like we saw this morning. And Peter baptized them. But when he got back to Jerusalem, these people who were very hung up on issues of circumcision and dietary restrictions, they were unhappy about it. In fact, this is what it says in Acts chapter 11. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Clearly, you are not as upset as you should be about that. They were very upset. And Peter explained to them what God had done. And they couldn't deny it. Some believers thought that circumcision and dietary restrictions were the gate that you entered in order to get to Jesus. And when these individuals came to Antioch, Peter, who had been sitting at the table and enjoying all the food, began to sit at another table and distance himself from people. Uh, you probably already know what that feels like. All you have to do is recall a memory back to school in the lunchroom. And there were just some tables you weren't invited to, or at least I wasn't. So Paul saw the hypocrisy and he confronted Peter in front of everyone. Why was Peter acting like this? And the scripture tells us because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. Maybe he was concerned about what they would say about him. Maybe he was concerned about how it could affect his status in the church back in Jerusalem. But there was a default thing in Peter that under peer pressure he went back to. And that's what we see. And that is what Paul addresses because he's telling Peter, all of a sudden you think something's more important than the gospel. Paul had a problem with that. And, and this is what's interesting, is Paul confronts him, did you catch it? Because I repeated it twice, for not living in line with the truth of the gospel. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all. What's interesting is that Paul does not accuse Peter of breaking a law. Because that would just be a different set of laws. What he does uh, challenge him is that you're not living out the gospel. Question, is there any area of your life where you're not breaking the law, but you might not be living out the truth of the gospel? So Peter was concerned. He felt this peer pressure. There's two words that show up repeatedly in the passage that we read. And it's very easy to think that these words are outdated and unnecessary and don't have any relevance to us who live in the 21st century with all of our smart devices, access to technology, and all of those things. And the first word is righteousness. Righteousness actually is important to everyone. Righteousness is important to everyone. It's important to you. We want to go to the right 
school, don't we? We want to be in the right crowd, don't we? We want to work for the right company. We want to marry the right person. We want to live in the right neighborhood. We want our children to make the right impression. And what do we do? We do a lot of things to make ourselves right enough to have those right things. That's the concept of righteousness. Every one of us live out our own concepts of righteousness all the time. The problem is, and this is very important, when we're doing those right things to get the right things that we want, who are we working for? Ourselves. I'm not just doing a right thing to do a right thing. I'm not doing a right thing to please God. I'm doing a right thing to get the school, the neighborhood, the crowd, the, the person that I want to make. It's all about me. Who am I doing it for? I'm doing it for me. What do we get out of it? I get something out of living right. That's the concept of righteousness. And so if we want to gain entry into our right world, and we do that work, there's another thing that happens is we tend to look down at people who are not in the right neighborhood, who are not in the right company, who are not married to the right person, whose little, little children are hellions. They're just little, little demoniac beasts running about, spreading the kingdom of hell wherever they go. Yeah. And we think like that, right? When we are getting what we worked so hard for, we start looking down at others because obviously if they had worked as hard as we did, they could have this too. How can you tell if this is happening to you? Are there people you avoid? Are there people you won't socialize with? Are there people you wouldn't invite to your house? Are there people you wouldn't accept an invitation to their house? You might be living by self-righteousness. And what Paul would say is, you're not living in line with the truth of the gospel. Second word is justification. Justification. Justification, as it turns out, is important to everyone too. Now the word justified does not mean that you are perfect. In fact, it implies that you are not. The reason that we have to be justified is because something happened that we wish had not happened. And then we have a motive or an excuse or a reason why, well, if, if you understood, then you would understand that my actions in that situation, even though ordinarily would not be acceptable, are actually justified. There was something that happened to me quite a few years ago. Uh, I was driving back from Buffalo, New York to Jamestown, where I lived at the time. And if you've ever made that travel, there's a, a, a road, it's, it's Route 60, uh, going from Jamestown or going from uh, Fredonia all the way down. It's just a two-lane road. It, it has more potholes than almost uh, any road in the state of New York. And the number of passing lanes, technically in those days, there were only two passing lanes on that entire route. And so if you got behind somebody, you just got behind them. The chance that you could get around them and not have traffic coming the other way was non-existent. And so I was driving, I was heading into to Gary, New York, which the speed limit is 30. And I'm very sensitive to that because I got a ticket once for going faster than 30 in Gary, New York. And so I started to slow down and there was a person that came up behind me and he wasn't happy. He was driving a truck and he had his son in the truck with him and he wasn't happy that I was going that slow. And so he came right up on my bumper. And when I say on my bumper, I don't just mean close. I mean, he pushed against my bumper, stepped on the gas and started pushing me down the road. And I wasn't sure where he was going to push me. So I pushed on my brakes, which caused skid marks. You could go back and look at them. Skid marks heading into Gary. This is a true story. I don't have to make up stories. The weirdest things happens to me. When that happened, the guy ran his truck around in front of me and stopped. And he got out and started banging on my window like he was trying to break the glass. And his son got in front of my car. 
So I took off. <laughs> His son was directly in front of me, and I didn't know how smart he was, but I figured he would be smart enough to get out of the way of the car. And I was right. <laughs> and I took off. And from that point, I sped as fast as my little Toyota Corolla would go. And I ran every stop sign and every red light, and I was heading straight to the police department, and this person was hot on my tail, chasing me the whole time. The, when I finally got close to the police department, they left. I was able to get his license plate. So being a good citizen, <laughs> I called it in. And they found out who it was. And uh, they went and arrested him. And of course, he denied it. But there was a way they could prove it was absolutely true. He had an unusual practice. And that is, he didn't like to try to put the license plate on the front bumper with the, you know, you have to reach your hand behind and, and, and turn the, the bolt. And so he, he let the screws come out the front and he turned the bolts off the front. And so he had four screws sticking out the front of his bumper, and it matched perfectly with the four holes he put in my back bumper. <laughs> and so he got arrested. Hallelujah. <laughs> but if a police officer had pulled me over while I was speeding and running red lights and stop signs, I would have told him, I'm justified. Those two people were trying to kill me. Arrest them. That's what I would have told them. Even though my actions are against the law, I felt I had a justifiable reason to break them. And so do we when we sin. And Paul has this idea that justification is not about if you understood my motive, you would understand my action. He says that doesn't work. This is what he says. If you understand God's motive, you will understand his action, and that's why I am justified. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. God justifies us based on what Christ did, his actions and his motives. And when Jesus died, his last will and testament was this that all of our sin debts would be paid by the price that he paid, and eternal life and eternal relationship with God would be granted to us. And because he didn't trust anybody to execute the will other than himself, he rose from the dead and became his own executor of the estate to make sure your sins were forgiven and you get God in heaven. Is that not good news? It is. See, the law proves we're sinners. And that's why we start making our justifications. The law wasn't to justify you. It was to show you you're often out of bounds. And justification has to be a gift. That's what it says, right? So we too have put our faith in Jesus Christ that we may be justified by faith in Christ, not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. This is why Paul did not accuse Peter of breaking laws, because all he's doing is changing the rules, making new laws. He says, you're not living out the gospel. If righteousness is based on our works, if justification is based on our motives, then who are we working for? Just ourselves. He points out that Peter's not living in line with the gospel. And then he says this, very famous words, if you've been around church for very long, you probably have heard this before. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. 
Paul creates this paradox. I no longer live. Now I live. What is he saying? I no longer live for myself. I'm not trying to do things just to get things. Let's suppose that in your neighborhood, there was a widow and she was wealthy. Not like just comfortable, a lot of money. I know you're surprised she's living in your neighborhood, but let's just go with the story. And you find out that because she has no family, she intends her to give her wealth to some of the neighbors in her neighborhood. Question, would that affect how you interact with her? Oh, we'd be over there shuffling out her driveway, mowing her lawn, pulling up weeds, asking if we can pick up something for her when we go to the store. Who are we working for? Working for ourselves. How could she ever know you actually cared? Like this. She could knock on your door one day and say, hello, I'm your neighbor. I know it doesn't look like it, but I actually have quite a bit of resources. And I just want you to know, I'm giving them all to you right now. I'm not gonna wait till I die. My lawyer is going to connect with you. You're gonna get the deed to my house, to other properties that I own. You're going to be co-listed on every bank account. You can sign any check. It's all yours. It's all yours. Would that inter change how you interact with that person? Yes. But now you're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it for her. This is exactly what God does. He says, I'm going to give it all to you. Justification righteousness, eternal life, relationship with him, complete access anytime, anywhere, for any reason to God. You have it all. Will that affect the way you interact with God? I no longer live for myself. I live for the one who gave himself for me and gave me everything that is the gospel. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, you have been so generous. We are so grateful. We don't have good enough reasons for our actions, but you have a good enough reason to forgive us. Our works are often about making our life better or easier, but your works are about making our life richer and fuller. Would you help us accept the truth of the gospel today? In the name of your son, Jesus, amen. Let's all stand together this morning.